that's me right there in a lab coat. So basically, it is a grand poll voted by the graduating class of my year back in 1997. So I was voted to be most likely to be a doctor in the future. I was a winner, and to be quite frankly, the graduating class was quite good or fortune teller. And I didn't disappoint him that much, as currently I'm a year in nose and throat doctor working in a Hong Kong government hospital. So let's take a poll here. Who wants to be a doctor when they're growing up or still have that idea somewhere down the road? Okay, see, few and raise. So that's good. So you must have, think of these questions and how to answer it because that's the most common questions being asked during a medical interview. Why do you want to be a doctor? So if you watch the news here, most of the straight A students from the HKCE examinations will probably answer the fo the, for, to these questions saying that they are straight A students, they want to learn, and medicine is just the way to go, and they can help people along the way. That's very typical, it's not very exciting. But once in a while, wouldn't it be interesting for someone to actually be a little bit more edgy, answer it, like a superhero, fighting every single medical diseases one by one, making Gotham City better place than we knew it. Okay, tackle problems raised by poverty, government negligence, corporate profiting in the expenses of the sick. That's a really good idea. That's a big, big change. But quite honestly, I didn't answer that during my medical school interview. Why? Well, that's the system we are talking about. You need to hit certain buttons in just to make sure that you get in the system. And our training systems is actually very rigid. Most medical students came into the field of medicines with a mission oriented mind. They are very eager to learn. They are proud of their abilities to treat and diagnose. And they are very happy and grateful with the trust that was invested in them by their patients. That's the very lovely personal side of medicines. However, there are also the very impersonal practical side of it. Starting with the teaching system. Basically, the teaching philosophy and also the uh, pedagogies in Hong Kong and many places around the world are quite rigid. Students have to go through different rotations, such as anatomy, physiology, medicines, surgeries, pediatrics, etc., in a very confined curriculum. And to end with it, top up with a big, big, big ex uh, examinations to ensure quality. So at the end of the day, well, we have this sort of assembly line doctors where somewhere down the line, they might forget what the original passion was. But this system works for many, many centuries. It works for my mentor, but is this the perfect system? I think it's far from it. And training for surgeons is even worse, even more of a top-down approach. Basically, it's an apprentice type of training. So if you have a good mentor, well, you're good. He or she will fight alongside with you. But if you have a not so kind-hearted one, then good luck. You probably have to be your own mentor. So let me introduce to you a little bit about currently the uh, evidence-based medicines in our world. Basically involved into a more self-auditing process. What it is is that your individual clinical expertise, you have to match it with the external evidence as integrations to finally meet the patient's expectations. So let's have a example, okay? So maybe recently somebody's so-called baby wants to prove that she has no plastic surgeries done to her face. 
So she went to some doctors, okay? So he performed some physical examinations, taking a look at the face, palpating it, looking for scar, etc., and then just conclude that she doesn't have any surgeries done. So is that evidence-based? Probably not. You're not very convinced because he doesn't even match it with what's out there, what other people are doing. So this ongoing self-auditing process is very, very important so that to ensure patients get the best treatment ever. But in order to get such evidence, it's a very painful uphill battling process because what we have to go through so many different trials, studies, and filter the information again and again through a review. And currently, in the field of medicines, basically we are so dependent on protocols because protocols are there for your reference, it's easy to follow. But then during a busy clinic, such as those in Hong Kong government hospital, we will tend to just fit the patients into that protocol and forget actually what the patient is asking for because that is way easier. And you can just say it basically that's evidence-based medicines. So that's the way to go. But is this truly how we help someone else? So if you have a new innovations or a new technique that you want to introduce, that from this diagram basically is at most an individual expert opinion. It's way down there. It's so hard to get accepted. So along with the education systems, the assembly line education systems, difficulties that encounters to gather enough evidence to pursue any sort of new ideas, creativity and innovations are often lost. Doctors lost their ideals, lost their passionate for what actually at the first place got them into medicines. But am I being too pessimistic here? But here and then we heard that there are new innovations around the world, which is true. And I'll use this diffusion of innovations curve um, published back in 1962 as illustrations. So basically, our populations are divided into five different categories. So we have the innovators. They only account for 2.5% of our populations. They are the risk takers. They have nothing to lose. They have the resources and they are willingness to try new stuff. And then we have the early adopters, which are considered to be the ones that checked in with the new information. They are willingness to try new stuff. But then the most important thing is they encourage the majority to adopt the innovations as well. The majority are divided into the early and the late one. The difference is that um, the early majority if they know a little bit more about the new things, they will use it. They're open-minded as well. But the late majority is that they probably just use it because it's uh, emerging norms, financials, necessities, or just peer pressure. But then we have the laggers, okay? They are a huge population if you consider them as well, 16%. Those usually cannot adapt to any sort of changes they are basically making decisions through their experience, and it's really hard to motivate them to adopt anything. So I would like to explain a personal experience to you. Basically, for ear surgeries, okay, this microscope was developed in 1950s. Uh, I'm sure everybody here have used a microscope before. Basically, you look through different lenses, and get a magnification. So this sort of equipment was being used for 50 more years for ear surgeries. It's very bulky. It's almost half the size of a compact car. It's hard to maneuver. And it's quite selfish because before the video systems, all the trainees can only peek through once in a while or in a sidearm to look what the actual surgeons are doing. So making the learning process quite difficult but it's been proven 
to work for almost half a century. Until recently, a lot of a group of great doctors introduced such idea using an endoscope, a friend that we actually knew for almost 20 odd years for no surgeries. So from this diagram, it makes a lot of sense because from a microscope, anything blocking your view is blocked. But my, an endoscope can bypass anything within a narrow canal and you can see whatever that is within the ear. So it makes a lot of sense. But since its introductions, its acceptance is rather slow. It's been here for almost five years, but not a lot of centers are doing it. So during this time, I want to use this benefit curve to illustrate what happens between an old technology and also a new technology. Basically, the green one is the old technology. It's well accepted, well proven to have lots of benefit, but over time, its benefits just plateaued. It goes nowhere. But once your new technology starts to pick up, it starts very low. Difference between the two curves are all the skepticisms, criticisms, all the disapproval by your seniors, etc. It's all there, all on, in between this curve. But given enough time, given enough promotions, slowly the new technology will pick up, up to a critical point that the two line crosses. From that point on, all you have is the joy or harvest from the new technology. So basically, it's a matter of time. It's a matter of time when you're willing to try this. The earlier you try it, the earlier you can get into that pie and enjoy it. So back to this graph. I have two questions. Which group you actually want to be? Which group, if you have a new idea, you want to promote it to? It's actually quite simple for me, because while well, the odds of being the actual innovators, 2.5% of the population, is slim. I won't bet on that. But being a early adopter may not be that difficult. All you need is a open mind, non-judgmental attitude towards any sort of new innovation. Talk to friends who share your same passion, okay? And you know, lead the majority into adapting new technology and information. That's the key. And for that 16% of the laggers, you can s stop wasting a lot of time, you know, try to comfort them or kiss their body parts, okay? So basically, I'll end my sharing tonight with this picture. So I recently uh, went to Italy, and basically this is the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. So it was painted by one of the f most famous artists of human history, Michelangelo. Just a little bit of history about this is that this ceiling is 20 meters off the ground. Michelangelo at that time was already famous, but not as a painter. It's a, he is a sculptor. He was merely contracted for such project because the architect at that time wanted to defame him, wanted to actually destroy all his reputation. He suggested that the scaffolding should be drilled on the ceiling. But Michelangelo said, once you've taken it off, you will have holes on the pictures. That's not very good. So he, via innovators, designed a new scaffolding. Not only can it function, it also didn't affect any sort of ceremony or surfaces of the chapel during that time. And those holes on the sidewall are still being used right now for renovations, etc. He also didn't listen to the Pope at that time about the content of the painting. He painted it all by his own thoughts. End up, this paintings over the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel 
remains one of the greatest piece of art ever known to mankind. So to conclude, if you ask me what is essence of change, my actual protocol answer will be embrace it and you never know what you get. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.